I'm Peggy Scott Laborde and welcome to Steppin' Out, spotlighting the New Orleans area's arts and entertainment scene. Seated at our table tonight, Grammy Award winning and beloved Orleanian singer Irma Thomas. So glad to have you with us. It's good to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled. <laughs> Poppy Ducker, host of the WWNO radio program, Louisiana Eats. Hi, Peg. Happy Chinese New Year Happy here. Happy Chinese New Year, that's what I'm celebrating. Absolutely. Band leader and drummer and jazz historian Barry Martin. Hey, Barry. Hello, Hello, sir. And stepping out, theater critic Alan Smason, who is also the editor of the Crescent City Jewish News. Hello, Alan. Hi. All right. And Poppy, new stuff. New stuff. And, you know, I, I decided that there was simply no way we could cover Valentine's on February 12th. Because <laughs> if you don't have reservations, it's basically all over for you, buddy. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you some ideas in case you missed that opportunity. I had the most incredible experience at Restaurant Revolution recently. Chef Erin Swanson is the pastry chef there. She's incredibly talented and she created for Valentine's Day, but these are new spring desserts that will be continuing right into the spring. So you can go celebrate a little Valentine's late. She paired these desserts with Molly Wismeyer, who of course is Food & Wine Magazine's one of their top 10 sommeliers last year. And we started with chocolate covered strawberry souffle with vanilla Ooh. roasted local strawberries. Ooh. With stra I never thought to roast a strawberry before. <laughs> it is the yummiest thing. With cream, with, with strawberries and cream ice cream. And Molly paired that with Jean Vassel Demi Sec Rosé Champagne. Oh, that was beautiful. Now that is crazy wicked. That's the chocolate Turbo Dog Stout Chocolate Cake with bar snacks. So there's popcorn, there's pretzel lavash, <laughs> pickled cashews, dulce de leche cream, and salted caramel ice cream. <laughs> and there were two pairings with that, and one of them was an old reserve Chateau Ballon Pinot de Charente that just really blew me away. Then, I've never had anything like this. This strawberry mousse, Louisiana strawberries and bananas with vanilla whipped cream, tarragon meringue, and strawberry feuilletine. Just remarkable. And if, by some chance, none of these strawberry things float your boat, at Restaurant Revolution, there's always truffles for dessert, and there is a little selection of their gorgeous, gorgeous truffles. They bring them out in a jewelry box, you know? <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot to be said about that. So get down to Restaurant Revolution for dessert and Molly Wismeyer's fabulous pairings, if nothing else. Then, a new opening, B.B. King's Blues Club. Now, this is about the seventh or eighth of his clubs to open up. It's where Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville was. And the reason that this is such big news to me is because I've been watching the career of the most incredible girl, Serena Johnson. Serena was John Besh's first Chef's Move recipient. And she has been working her way up since she had that incredible honor. And now she's the executive chef. This is her first executive chef job. And talk about a scrapper. I'm telling you what, Serena is a winner. The barbecue is delicious. And there's a huge extensive menu. It's not just barbecue, it's seafood, it's yummy things. And there's music all the time. They're open seven days a week, Sunday through Thursday until midnight, until 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. Great live music, great venue, great barbecue. And tell my friend Serena, congratulations, and then I said hi. And speaking of John Besh's Chef's Move Foundation, they are currently accepting applications through March 31st. And this is the most incredible opportunity of a lifetime. Um, you have to be a minority. Um, you have to want to pursue a career in food. And you can be a pastry chef as well. And the foundation's doing a lot of interesting new things. They've just started a membership program. And for $20 a month or a one-time payment of $240, you get access to monthly pop-up dinners, VIP happy hours at Besh's restaurants, advanced copies of his cookbooks, and wine and cooking classes that John is doing that you have to be a member. It's a great thing. And his big fundraiser is coming the weekend of March 18th and 19th. And they're doing something new this year. They're doing the FET Fest on Friday, March 18th from 8 until 11 p.m. 
only $80 at the Civic Theater, including tickets, open bar, and delicious food from Chef John Besh, Chef Justin DeVillier, uh, David Slater from Emeralds, Kelly English of the Second Line, and the music will be by Tyson and the Soul Rebels, and it's going to be really, really a fun night at the Civic, and that's before the big dine around night the next night. So get your tickets now. They're sure to sell out. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, and we Peg. turn to Irma. And Irma, instead of just like having a birthday and celebrating at home, you're kind of sharing it <laughs> and, and doing good at the same time. Tell us about your special well, event. I, you know, how many times you turn 75? <laughs> <laughs> Not too many. <laughs> and I thought that it would be, it would be a nice gesture to help a program that I was the initiator of and it got off to a good start. So I said, you know, I've never done a fundraiser for them. I'm talking about the Irma Thomas Wise Women's Center at Delgado where I graduated from. And uh, they do a lot of great things for the students there and those who are striving to try to stay in school. So I said, you know, this would be a good idea. So I dedicated my 75th birthday to raise funds for them. And that's going to be a special concert tomorrow, tomorrow night? Tomorrow night. At, it's at the Student Center and on Delgado City Park campus. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of uh, patron party levels oh, and yeah. also just a regular ticket, uh, mm -hmm. all good things. But yes, you and Delgado go way back, Oh, don't yeah. You? It took me 15 years to get a two-year degree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I uh -huh. hung in there and I did graduate. I was 71 by the time I, 61 wow. by the time I graduated, but I started at 45, so you know, it took me a while. <laughs> well, before, <laughs> before we continue our conversation, though, we have some special footage um, at your annual Mother's Day concert oh, yeah. at Audubon yeah. Zoo. We wanted to show just a, a little <laughs> glimpse of that. Let's take a look. <laughs> New New Orleanians, if you've never seen you perform, okay? <laughs> we just wanted to give that little taste. And so once again, um, a Saturday night at Delgado. Uh, but back to Mother's Day, too. How long have you been doing that? I think it's coming up on 33 years. <sighs> Incredible. And to think it started out as, a, as an advertisement ploy to get families to come to the zoo, and it worked so well, they said it ain't broke, they wasn't going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I was there that day, and yes, uh, very, very much fun. Um, just backing up a little bit, we, we saw Miss Allen Toussaint, and I know you had such a wonderful relationship with uh -huh. him over the years, uh -huh. huh? Uh -huh. I remember um, in the conversation with him uh, in terms of his writing, when he was writing a song specifically for a woman's voice, he said, yours was the voice he always well, heard. I guess being the only female on the label at that time, I guess it kind of stuck in his head, I'm sure. <laughs> 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 days of being in Allen's when in New Orleans for a half of a double front room I call yeah, it a front yeah. room because I grew up in a half of a double yeah. you know um, it, you were the only girl you were as far as I know if I was the only female on minute label at that time yes <laughs> <laughs> and some of those memories. I mean, did you have a favorite song from all those wonderful? Well, not particularly because I enjoyed doing them all. It was it was fun because we did all the rehearsing in his mom's living room, and we were well prepared by the time we got to the studio. The only song that he didn't give me the whole verses to was "It's Raining," and back then we had only had one track recording, so he really had a lot of faith in my ability because he gave me the second verse during the recording at the time we were actually making the record, so. <laughs> But it turned out okay. I didn't have to do a second take, so it must have been all right. <laughs> Some of these songs were written rather quickly, weren't they? I don't know. He when you gave them to me, they were already done. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's not like you saw him go into a corner no, and say, I'll be no, right back, no, okay? No, not really. His favorite writing room was the bathroom. He said that was the one place he could get, get, get some peace and quiet and nobody would bother him. 
<laughs> but other than that, that was the joke of the house. <laughs> now back back to you, of course. Um, you're traveling around. I mean, gigs not as here. much as I used to, but okay. I still travel. I still do. A lot of my work takes me out of the city, so mm -hmm. you know that's that's not unusual for me. I would love to be somewhere locally on a regular basis because since we since Katrina decided she loved our club better than we did, yeah. we haven't really gotten back into the business. So I don't really have a regular spot here locally, but that mm -hmm. would be a thought someone was thinking out there, you know. Yeah. I wish your club was back because it was in Mid-City, and Mid-City is was, just jumping. It was, and then you know? I used to do the beans and the rice and all yeah. that good stuff, so it, it was fun. We, we had a lot of neighbors and friends who would come by regular, and they would actually request mm -hmm. what they wanted to eat. That's how bad it was. <laughs> do you um, enjoy being recognized? I have fun with it because I'm in places people least expect me to be. I've never had an entourage, so you know I don't draw a lot of attention to myself on a regular basis. So when people wait, you know, are walking and they do a double take and they don't. <laughs> I know, just as so many um, Orleanians were, you were displaced at Katrina. Is it oh, nice to be home and you're oh, back in your Oh, it's wonderful to be home. I mean, it took us a couple of years to get back, but it's wonderful. I never thought about living anywhere else, to be honest with you. I yeah. never gave it any thought to be anywhere else. I knew eventually we would be back in New Orleans, and here we are. <laughs> and we are so glad. Once again, Saturday night at Delgado. Night and at happy Delgado. birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're so thrilled you're here. Thank you. And moving on, we're at, we're at a musical mode here, Mr. Mr. Barry Martin, and wearing many hats, and you even have one of your hats right there, oh, yeah. being a longtime drummer, band leader, jazz historian. So uh, tomorrow with uh, Dr. Bruce Rayburn at the Hogan Jazz Archive, y'all going to talk about the, the sort of the olden days of um, traditional jazz bands. Tell us about that. Well, brass bands, traditional brass bands, but it's at the Mint. The uh, U.S. Mint on Esplanade. To 3 o'clock tomorrow, which uh -huh. is Saturday, uh -huh. and a lot of people come to it, but they're making a special film of it this time. And we, um, we don't deal with any of the modern brass bands. We don't know much about them. They're a bit young. Mm -hmm. But he talks and comes up and shows a lot of old pictures uh -huh. of, you know, the Excelsior Brass Band, the Onward Brass Band. And then I talk about the things which I know about. I came to New Orleans January the 4th, 1961. And so I talk about the bands that I saw. The Ricker Brass Band, led by Percy Humphrey. What a band. Mm -hmm. I can still hear that to, in my ears today. And talk about this between Percy and Willie and so many members of that family, yeah. you know. Well, they yeah, there was so Earl, to too, the brother. He yeah. lived in West Virginia for a long time, but I used to correspond with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finally met him, he was great, you know. In fact, Percy was the be best friend of mine. He came and stayed at my house in England mm -hmm. in the year of our Lord, 1968. Well, Barry, you know, you're a great example, along with folks like Orange Callan and, um, and, and Lars Edegren, of living in Europe and various countries and just hearing the music and buying the records and saying, you got to come, you just had to be here. Well, yeah, that's what brought me here. Ooh. And when I came here, I didn't want to leave, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. but there was a few problems. I'm sure it was challenging, yes, challenging to say the Challenging is one way to put it on <laughs> uh -huh. television, but uh -huh. I mean... Uh, <laughs> That's right, there were issues, which I know you've shared with us in the past, yeah, in terms yeah. of those the bad old days with, of course, uh, segregation, and that, that's right, legally, you and, 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 and black musicians couldn't play together. Couldn't right? play together at all. We had to make one of the first recordings I made here, go over to the Hopes Hall, over in Algiers, and it was sweltering hot, we had to close all the shutters. Because the people so you're afraid of getting arrested, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible. In fact, I was arrested, but we don't need to talk about that. We don't need to go now. into that. Well, this is a good show, and people, yeah. the, there's an audience, there's only the two of us. I just sit there like this for a while Bruce talks, and then they think, where did he come from? He's not saying <laughs> a damn thing. <laughs> then I get up and start telling them. It's all personal. Recollections. Well, something um, else about you is that you've you've preserved a lot of the music of the brass bands through your work over the years with, um, with GHB Records, huh? I, I mean, didn't yeah. you chronicle? You took yeah. a lot of those older tapes that William uh, historian William Russell did. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the bands that are now on CD. Well, um, the, the, there's Bunk's Brass Band, which well, was Bunk Johnson, Johnson and George uh -huh. Lewis, and Jim Robinson, and whatnot and the Eureka Brass Band uh, that was recorded by a friend of mine who just died, Alden Ashforth. He just passed. Oh, uh -huh. and, uh, 
uh, bands like that, you know. And, um, but the main, one of the main things, I'm not saying it was the best, but I said it was one of the main things that I was involved with. I helped Harold Dejon, who's my son, who you all met, mm -hmm. he's his godfather. Oh, okay. And I helped Harold organize the Olympia band oh. because Harold was playing with all these brass bands and organizing it. Said, "Come on, let's start. Hit that drum. Come on, come on. Blah blah blah." And none of them were his bands. And I said to him, "I said, why the why will you don't start your own brass band? You'd be a ruined success." He had so much charisma too. Oh, man. fantastic! Uh, what is it? Everything is lovely. Everything that was is that lovely. was his motto, huh? I've Everything never known such a lovely. happy man as him. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't. He just never got yeah. miserable with anything. You and know? talk about going way back, because I remember having a chance to chat with him one time, and he was on the riverboats in the yeah. heyday, the riverboats, the 30s and 40s, and he knew A.J. Piron, a real jazz pioneer. Right. Too. Right, right. But that's so interesting. I didn't know you had that connection. You were part of the glue. Oh yeah, he he came over and stayed for three months with us in England, wow. and he played all jazz jobs. And then we got this the weirdest thing. We got a straight job just for dancing, <laughs> where nobody knew who he was, nobody knew who I was. <laughs> he was looking forward to that so much. If the check cashes, right? <laughs> oh, no, but he he was really because it was straight yeah. things that yeah. he played. A lot of the jazz bands hired Harold because he could play a straight lead on any number you want. On sax. And, if yeah. he wanted waltzes, whatever, you know. Um, well, once again, you'll get to reminisce since yeah. tomorrow, Saturday. Tomorrow, yeah. Okay, afternoon at the Mint. Mm -hmm. when, uh, here we go, starting at 2 o'clock and with Dr. Bruce Rayburn of Two Lanes Hogan Jazz Archive. Thank you very much. And New Orleans Magazine's Quiz Queen, Julia Street, has a question for us. Last time, Robert Reynolds told us who recorded the original version of Giacomo and what group recorded the version that became famous nationwide, Sugar Boy Crawford and the Dixie Cups. Now, tonight's question, one Irma Thomas song refers to the weather in its title. Another mentions a certain season. Hmm, name them. Email your answers to stephanout at wies.org. Our prizes, a year's subscription to Louisiana Life magazine. And we also have two dish towels with the messages, play it again, salmon, and beyond a reasonable trout. <laughs> our nod to Lent from our friends at wearablevegetables.com. And you can visit WYES.org for our online calendar to see our lineup of events, including Love Taps, an evening of romance and rhythm under the direction of choreographer Heidi Malmer. And uh, that is going to be kicking off, if you will, literally and figuratively at NOCA next Friday with performances uh, for two weekends. Also, you can link to our WYES website, the two YouTube channel, to view our program on our webpage. Let me just say, Irma, it's a high honor to be a Julia Street question here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Alan. And reminded me, too, uh, as Barry was talking about uh, Milton Baptiste, who I worked with uh, yes. years ago, Talk too, a great, a great musician as well. Yeah. Well, as the final curtain was drawing to a close on Carnival this year, I had an opportunity to look back and survey some of the many photos and different opportunities I had to make connections with the theater people. And uh, I'm starting off here with a picture of my mom and me at Gallier Hall, where I had narrator duties for the cruise of ancient druids and Hermes, Okeanos, Mid-City, and Toth. And so there we were in our in our in our splendor. And she was such a part of Venus for some reason. Well, of years, course, yeah. Venus, and she was so. a senior. And of course, she she worked uh, with the, the crew of Okeanos. She had her own subcrew called Anubis. That's another story. <laughs> then it was over to the Orpheus escapade, where float builder Barry Kern was seen with the uh, Orpheus captain Sonny Bory and artistic director Derek Franklin. Many of them, of course, remember for their work with uh, Le Petit Theater some years ago. Uh, and then there was some sadness to that celebration, though, because it was revealed that night that uh, the glitter queen from Broadway. Broadway bound, Mrs. Helen Bory Koenig, uh, the, that's uh, Sonny's mother, had died tragically that morning. And of course, uh, we wanted to show a picture of her with Florence Wingerter from Orpheus. Uh, Harry Connick Jr. sang a, a really moving version uh, for Miss Helen, uh, you know, for Sonny. Um, Sonny, of course, was his drama teacher at Jesuit. And of course, uh, everybody there sang walk? along, just a closer, a closer walk, walk with yeah. thee. And uh, of course, the services will be held uh, tomorrow at, at Shane. So anybody wants to go check that out. Then on Mardi Gras, it was 
was going over to uh, Sid Arroyo's apartment, and there I found, believe it or not, uh, Sid, of course, the former Vince Vance frontman, uh, Chris Ventavenia, the director, and Alex Martinez Wallace from the NOLA Project, and and of course, uh, a lot of actors on the streets. I, I could see a lot of people, but even in the crew of Tux on Saturday, I spotted playwright and theater owner Jim Fitzmorris. He was on the route there, and I, I wanted to mention that Jim has a new book coming out, and this ties in with his season for the spring and summer that he's going to have at the theater at St. Claude. And of course, the very first thing is he's bringing back Be a New Orleanian, the swearing in ceremony. One yeah. of the funniest things you'll see. And again, they have a book to go along with it. This is from Dirty Coast Productions. So if you get a chance, he's going to have book signings, etc., coming up. But this is the first of his many different uh, productions he's going to have at the theater at St. Claude. Check that out. And you can check out their uh, website to find out more about that. His show's going to run till Leap Day, so they have an extra day on the 29th. Meanwhile, over at the Sanger Theater, it's time to welcome a six-time Tony Award winner, and that is Kinky Boots. This included Best Musical, Best Book, Best Score, Best Choreography, and Best Orchestration. Uh, the show tells the story of really two men with father issues uh, and how they band <laughs> together to save a, a British shoe manufacturing plant with a new product destined to sweep the fashion world. Kinky Boots uh, is uh, going to be a, a touring production, fantastic show. I loved it dearly. Music by uh, Cindy Lauper and a book by Harvey Firestein. You can't go wrong with that combination. It was really wonderful when I saw it on Broadway and I know they're going to do a good job here so go check that out. Meanwhile, Rock Fire Theater, who jointly produced recently The Santa Land Diaries and before that had done Pterodactyls, a joint production, uh, at the now uh, shuttered Old Marquet Theater. I'm sorry to report that they had closed at the end of the month. They moved their venue for their next production over to MAGS 940. That's 940 Legion Fields. And uh, this is going to be, believe it or not, yes, uh, I can't wait to, to hear this one, uh, Abraham Lincoln's Big Gay Dance Party. Yes, I did say that, didn't I? But the premise behind this send-up is that it's a, a teacher uh, who is uh, teaching history, and she says in, in some ways that she believes that maybe the great emancipator was perhaps our nation's first gay president. Well, there's some premise behind that. Mm. And apparently the audience gets to vote in what section, there are three of them, appears first. So you get a chance to kind of like orchestrate the, uh, the night too. So two of the members of Rockfire are Matt Reed and Kevin Murphy, both of whom scored big with Peter Pan. Matt, of course, was Captain Hook. And uh, of course, you may remember um, uh, Kevin doing Shrek, and he was also Roger Debris and the producers. So they're going to have a lot of fun with this one. This is going to run all the way till, uh, I believe, February the 22nd. And again, it's at Mags 940. Normally, when I preview a show, though, I wanted to mention they. I talk about the, what's coming up with the show and the producers and the actors and things of that sort. But I wanted to talk about something coming up with Anthony Bean Community Theater, the home on Carrollton of their theater and acting school, and the home of sellout shows of. Irma, right? They had, they had two big productions there. They sold out uh, fantastic. But Anthony is pleased to say that he is going to be moving his theater now and his acting school to Gentilly, 3720 mm. Paris Avenue. Mm. And uh, again, uh, it'll be at the uh, former St. Raymond uh, Church and School. So if you get a chance to go check out, his first production is going to be on Alan Toussaint. So it's going to be oh, Southern great. Nights. Okay. And, and uh, again, uh, his last production of Denise uh, Rain Wilson's The Jungle King, starring Martin Batts Bradford, uh, will be seen uh, starting Valentine's Day. No production on Saturday night, so okay. keep that in mind. Thank you, Alan. And now it's time for our picks. Irma, where are you performing this weekend? Oh, Valentine's. From, yeah. I'm going to be at the Paragon in Marksville, Louisiana. All right. Great. <laughs> Poppy. And if you're flunking Valentine's on Sunday, you have yet <laughs> another chance on Tuesday night at Bellic. Brian Kainz, who is a bar chef, is doing a chocolate and amaro pop-up at Bellic. Baron. <clears throat> Well, look for you when. <laughs> I just do private jobs, except uh -huh. we got the the uh, what's it called French, French, French Quarters okay. Festival, okay. and then we opened the French Quarters Festival for some English people uh -huh. with a parade down All Bourbon right. okay. and the Jazz Festival. Thank you, Alan. Two picks: Jefferson Performing Arts Society uh, in West Wego, the Teatro Wego. They're going to have the uh, armor and. Um, uh, Amorous Ambassador, that's going to be Amorous Ambassador, it's going to be next weekend opening up. And then Brenda Duthie, who's one of my favorite cabaret performers, is going to do Kurt Vile songs at the Marity Opera House Ooh. next Wednesday. And I think tickets are only $12 for adults and $8 for deal. students. It's okay. really going to be fun. Thank you. And before we go to my picks, here is the historic meeting of the courts of Rex and Comus from our broadcast of the Ball Mardi Gras Night. With me were Carnival historian Errol Laborde and Dr. Stephen Hales, Rex archivist. Since 1882, this wonderful ritual that is 
really the, the climax to Carnival. Note the silver and the gold. Okay, so this would be the meeting of the courts. Rex and Thomas. Now it's all up to the captain, right, Errol? Captain's rule. Changing the partners here. Robert Maxwell in the back with the Jimmy Maxwell Orchestra. Looking conducting. This shares a lot with the ballet, I think. It's uh, carefully choreographed, it's, uh, it's meaningful. Uh, it, it's the same and it's different every year. Carol, I know we have a bit of a tradition of our own um, in terms of quoting from a beloved carnival historian. Would you do the honors? Yeah, for as long as we've been doing this broadcast, we've always uh, quoted from maybe the most beautiful passage ever written about Mardi Gras, a guy named Perry Young, who wrote a book called The Mystic Crew. And Young wrote that Carnival is the butterfly of winter. Its last mad flight of Mardi Gras forever ends its glory. Another season is the glory of another butterfly, and the tattered scattered fragments of rainbow wings are in turn the record of his day. That sounds nice, it's, it's, it's a beautiful metaphor about the butterfly of winter. Uh, Perry Young could have stopped right there and would have had something, something great. But, you know, the second paragraph, what he's talking about is that there's so much to Carnival. Uh, beyond the butterfly, there's the, the tattered scattered fragments of, of rainbow wings. And so to understand, especially those of us, and I know Steve went to this, those of us who've done research on Carnival, it's just so deep and extensive and there's just so much of it in, in, uh, in New Orleans. of the entire Rex Ball and Meeting of the Courts will be available soon for $34.95, and that includes shipping and handling. Call 486-5511 to order yours. And now my picks. The annual Metropolitan Opera National Council auditions will be held at Loyola University this weekend. Tomorrow's auditions are from 9.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. and are free and open to the public. And Sunday, they will be held from 1.30 to 5 p.m. and just a $10 admission helps raise funds to support Support the young singers who will be selected. It all takes place at Roussel Hall. Call 8615882 for more information. And thanks to the Amici organization who organized these events. And Genevieve Munson Trimble will be honored on the launch of her brand new book, Afton Villa, The Birth and Rebirth of a 19th Century Louisiana Garden, with a signing and reception next Wednesday evening, February 17th, at the Pavilion of the Two Sisters in City Park, published by LSU Press. Mrs. Trimble was very instrumental and revitalizing the park's botanical garden. Thank you all so much, Irma. So great to have you. Thank you, Thank you Barry. Thanks. Good night. Good night.